Um, All right, so we're going to get right into this. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to start a a new series. It won't be a very long series, uh, but I'm really excited about it. So we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. And my title for today is The Fruit of the Spirit, Part 1, How to Spot a Fake. Hmm. How how do we spot a fake? How is it when when you when you want to look at something and and maybe one's real and one's fake? How do you tell? Like like if you have to really know that thing, uh, we've actually got some pictures here. Go ahead, John, with that that first one there. How do you spot a fake? All right. So uh, anybody a big fan of Gucci Gucci purses? Um, I guess on the left hand side it's real. The right hand side's fake. Maybe the the tiger's coming out a little bit more. I don't. I don't know, sure. Listen, I was just in New York, in Chinatown. They all look real to me, but they're way cheaper. So it's all good. All right, so, so let's see the next one here. All right, a Rolex. Maybe you think you know Rolexes, but apparently the one on the left is fake. The one on the right is real. Can anybody tell the difference? Yeah, me neither. Okay, go ahead. All right, how about some Yeezys? Anybody know what Yeezys are? There's probably a few. If you don't, you're probably better off not knowing what Yeezys are, okay? I don't really know which one's real or fake. I can't tell there. Okay, so we, we couldn't forget about the ladies. Who, who knows what these shoes are? You can just raise your hand. It's okay. Nobody wants to admit they know what golden gooses are. Okay, so these are golden goose shoes. Now, listen, I'm not throwing shade on anybody that owns golden goose shoes, okay? But... These are shoes, they kind of look like Converse, okay? They're just tennis shoes. And and here's the thing, they're extremely expensive. But here's the crazy thing about it that I still can't wrap my mind around. You buy them brand new, dirty. Not throwing shade, just you, you do you. If you own a pair of Golden Gooses, you're obviously way cooler than I am, okay? All right, what, what else do we have here? All right, how about a diamond here? Can you tell the real diamond, the fake diamond? Apparently, if you can kind of see some things through it or see some letters through it, maybe, that means it's fake. I don't really know. So those are kind of some things that we can compare. Um, A few, a couple months ago, I would say, when I was first preparing for the Taming Your Tongue series, which we're going to refer to a little bit today, I I thought that I was going to go in a little bit different direction on my first message, and I I saved a bunch of photos of something that I wanted to do, and then I just decided to kind of not do that and go in a little different direction. And, and that happens a lot. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use those, and so I delete them. But as I was, I went to go delete them, and I was like, you know what, I, I just, I want to keep those. I'm going to use them for something. So they've been clouding up my desktop. Happy to say I'm finally going to uh, get through them today. So uh, let's see if these next pictures, you can see the real one and the fake one. Okay, can, these are cake. Everybody ever, ever go watch Cake Fails? Okay, these are Cake Fails. The one on the left, although I really have no idea what's going on. Then the one on the right looks like a murder scene. I don't know. Okay, go ahead to the next one. All right, yeah, there you go. You got Ariel. Wow. She's a looker, huh? All right. Uh, unicorn. That is the scariest unicorn I have ever seen in my life, but Okay. All right, next. <laughs> Bell. Bell got some issues going on, okay? I don't even know. Go ahead, next one. Bluey. Man. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> now, now listen, listen. There's moms out there. They're doing their best, okay? So try not to laugh too hard at this, okay? All right, next one. All right, there, there's another aerial. Just, I don't, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, and the last one here, <laughs> Elsa. Now, Elsa, I, I don't know what the jaw thing is going on there. I, I just got to say, if there is evidence of evolution, that's it right there, okay? I'm just saying. So, all right, please get that off of the screen. All right. So, it's difficult sometimes to see the difference between a real and a fake, like the Rolex or the Yeezys or any of those shoes or anything like that. Sometimes it's really easy like the cake. But here's a bigger question. How do you distinguish the difference between a real Christian 
and a fake Christian? Is it possible to... (laughs) That's neat. (laughs) I have never seen that before, but you guys got it going on back there. It's really... I don't even know how to cover after that. It's really difficult to determine, maybe even impossible to determine the difference between a real Christian and a fake Christian just by looking at someone's appearance. Now, go ahead. I got one more picture. I'm hoping that we can get it up there. All right. Now, obviously, two super stylish guys up there in their, in their sweaters right there. Um, which one's the Christian and which one's not? Can you tell? Like, I mean, you may have your theory, like, I'm not really a button-down guy, I'm a pullover guy, so obviously the pullover is the Christian, uh, maybe you're the opposite, I don't know, but you can't really tell. And I have no idea why I chose this weird picture of these two guys, I don't know, I just thought it was kind of funny. Larry and I said, you know, that, that's us right up there, I don't know, but you can't really tell. Now, it's really important, I, I want us all to understand my goal in this series is not necessarily to determine or distinguish the difference between who is a real true Christian, a real true follower of Jesus, and not. That's not my goal here. Now, we're going to kind of bump up against that several times in this, but that's not what I'm trying to do. And by the way, that's not really our job, right? Now, now, us, us real Christians, and I throw those air quotes if you remember that from friends, if it's, you know, us real Christians, we often think it's our job to determine who's a real Christian and not, but that's not really our job. Whose job is that? That's God's job. Yeah, we can't really see inside of people. However, we can watch people. Now, not necessarily like their appearance, but, you know, whether they're, the, you know, the button-up or the pullover sweater or just the way that they look. But we can actually watch somebody and see evidence of being a follower of Jesus. Now, again, what's ultimately inside of their hearts, we don't know, and it's not our determination whether or not we say, oh, they're really a Christian, they're not a Christian. Again, that's God's job. But it is really important to understand that we can see other people, and here it is even more important than that, that other people can watch us and see if we are really walking the walk and talking the talk. If we are really, truly acting like a real follower of Jesus. Now, I always try to have a key statement, you guys know. It, this is, the key statement is, if you forget about everything else, if you sleep through the whole message, just remember this right here. Our key statement is, true followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit and sanctification. True followers of Jesus, those who are really have committed their life to Jesus, they are true Christians, their lives will be identified by fruit and and sanctification. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about sanctification next week, but sanctification is that process of moving from like a new believer, like I'm just drinking milk, like I have really no idea what this Bible says and it's so confusing, but I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. So from there, all the way to how did Jesus live and that's how I want to live. Now are we ever going to reach Jesus' status? No, but that's still the goal. So that's sanctification, that growth, that process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. So a true follower of Jesus, we should be able to look at their lives and we should be able to look at our lives and see fruit and sanctification. Now, this doesn't mean that believers never struggle with sin, right? Don't raise your hand, but anybody ever struggle with sin? Yeah, every single one of us in here. In fact, Paul, I mean, like the Apostle Paul, he wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. 
He said in Romans 7, he's like, you know, the things that I want to do, the, the good things, the right things, those that I want to do, I, I oftentimes I don't do them. And the things that I don't want to do, the, the sin and the junk in my life, those are the things that I often do. And he's like, I'm conflicted. I, I, I struggle with this. And that's like, no, but you're the Apostle Paul. And he's like, yes. That's exactly right. So, so yes, we're going to struggle as followers of Jesus with sin, but there ought to be fruit and that growth process, the sanctification in our lives. We don't, we don't try harder and produce fruit in our lives. That's not how it works. Well, I, I want to be a good person, and so I'm just going to try hard and produce fruit. That's not how that works. In fact, Hosea, in chapter 14, verse 8, Hosea is a prophet, and he's speaking on behalf of God. He says, your fruitfulness, this is God speaking through him, your fruitfulness comes from me. That's it. It is the presence of God in our lives that produces fruit. Nowhere else. Now, I know unbelievers that are amazing people. I know unbelievers that are way more generous than some of the believers that I know, and way more kind, and just way more loving, unfortunately. But see, that's, that's just kind of a personality thing, but true fruit that we're going to look at over these next few weeks, true fruit comes only from God. In fact, what, what do we say? We say the fruit of the, the Spirit. That's right. True fruit only comes from God. So the big question is, what exactly is fruit? And why are we talking about it? Well, I guess a little confession. As we did the Taming the Tongue series uh, over the past couple of months, when we were talking, it was, it was really kind of a lot of negative, wasn't it? It was about how much damage your tongue can do. And your tongue is, is like, like a spark that ignites a fire and it just burns down like acres and acres. And we talked about fires and we talked about your tongue is like a horse's bridle or a rudder on a ship. And it will just steer you wherever, wherever your tongue goes. That's where your, your life is going to take. And we talked about all of the damage that our tongues and, and, our, and ultimately our negative hearts can do. And so, and, and, and I, I love that series. I got a lot from that series. But when it was over, I was like, wow, we really talked a lot on the negative side. I want to kind of flip that script. And I want us to talk about something positive, some positive growth that we need to have in our lives. And so I just feel kind of that's how God led us to this right here. So um, at the end of that series, I asked a question. And it was kind of an open-ended question. Normally, I try to give us applications, something that we can go out and apply and, and do, and, and just kind of some, some handles to give to you guys. Well, I kind of threw this question out there, and it was this. It says, will you allow the Holy Spirit to do a heart transplant in you so that you can live in heavenly wisdom. And we talked about heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. Remember the earthly wisdom was that wisdom that uh, James put in quotes. But the question was, will you allow the Holy Spirit, God living in us, to do a heart transplant? To remove us out of the equation and to put more and more and more of him in there. Now, sometimes, yes, we struggle and we pull some of him out and we put more of us in, and, and, but that's part of it. That's growth. That's like, no, 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 no. Jesus, I want you in my life. No more of me. Less of me, more of you. And that's that growth. And so that's what I challenged us all to do. Allow God to do a, a heart transplant in us to change us. And so I, I just wanted to kind of focus on that. So the, the big question is, what does that look like? How exactly does that heart transplant happen? And ultimately, we ask this question, what exactly is fruit? Well, when I say fruit, I can almost guarantee you, and we've already referenced it today, that most of us in this room think of one thing, and that is what? 
Yeah, exactly. The fruit of the Spirit. You're like, I think that's it, but I'm not going to say it out loud in church. That'd be weird if I got it wrong. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit. When I say, hey, produce fruit, what is fruit? You would say the fruit of the Spirit, and then we would go to the list, right? You're not wrong, but you're not fully right. Fruit is so much more than that, and yes, that's really the big common one that we all think of, and that is what this whole series is going to be about. But before we get into that more next week, I wanted us to look at different types of fruit just as a challenge to us to see, um, are we living in this fruit? Are we producing this fruit in our lives? Because we said true followers of Jesus are going to produce fruit. So this is a really, really big wake-up call to every single one of us as we're going through this to say, yeah, I'm not really doing that. And, oh, I, mean, I might not be doing that as well as I could be. And, oh, yeah, that one definitely I'm not doing. And so it's not to condemn any of us, myself included, because I am not great at doing these. But it's to get us to realize God has so much more for us. And God wants us to produce fruit in our lives for him, for his kingdom. I say it like this all the time, to do things that are going to matter in a thousand years. And if we're lacking that in our lives, how sad. We're missing it. We're missing what God has in store for us. So, Galatians chapter 5, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, you guys probably knew that we were going to go there. Galatians 5, we're just going to read these two verses today and then we're going to move on a little bit. But this is the passage that when we say fruit and we say fruit of the Spirit, this is where everybody usually thinks of, or most people I should say. So Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, it says this. But the fruit of the Spirit, now I'll pause right there, I can't get too far without pausing. Recognize that word, but. We say this all the time. This word is huge. This this means, I know we're starting out with that word, but it means, man, I said a bunch of other stuff, and we're going to get to that stuff next week. But like, like all of that, but. So, so, so key here. But the fruit of the Spirit is, here we go, love joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So that's a really good list, isn't it? I mean, those are really great things to live by. And yes, those absolutely are fruit. But they're just one category of fruit. So we've got five different kinds or different categories of fruit. The first one is virtue. Virtue. If you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. The first category of fruit is virtue. And that's what we find here in Galatians chapter 5. Like I said, this whole series, we're going to come back uh, to these and kind of break them down a little bit. But I want us to think of that list like this. Virtue is like a bouquet of flowers, or or this this list, these fruits of the Spirit. Um, Isla is in a musical production in Marathon this weekend. We've been going down there for seven weeks, and she's been, for twice a week, we've been driving her down to Marathon, and we live at 102, uh, and she's been practicing for two hours from 6 to 8 p.m., practicing really hard for this big production. Right, And so it was Friday night, it was last night, and today at 3 o'clock, if you guys want to come and join, you can come. Um, But Isla has a bit of a fan club, okay, should I say. And I won't make you raise your hands, but several of you already in this room have gone down there and watched her in her production. And she has absolutely loved it. Now, as a result of that, on the island in my kitchen, it is full of bouquets of flowers. I mean, there are, I should have taken a picture of them this morning. There are several dozen roses and and bouquets of flowers. They're absolutely beautiful. But I want us to think of these fruits in Galatians 5 or virtue like a bouquet of flowers. 
Like flowers are really pretty. Like if you just have one single red or a white rose, it's beautiful, right? And you just put it in a nice vase, just one, it's great. Or maybe you take some lilies, maybe some big calla lilies or something. That's, those are really pretty. Um, and, and maybe you put some orchids. I'm, I'm an orchid guy. I love orchids. Orchids are beautiful. The baby's breath, eh, just kind of some filler, right? Okay, but you take all of these different flowers with the baby's breath and you put them together and what do you have? You have this beautiful bouquet of flowers and they're, they're different sizes, and they're different textures, and they're, they're like different colors, and, and, and they look completely different, but together they just make this beautiful bouquet. And that's exactly what this list is here in Galatians chapter 5. Love, peace, patience, goodness, all of these things, they're amazing things on their own. But the life of a follower of Jesus, we should have all of those things combined. Like, it's really hard to be a person that just loves, but there's no joy in your life, or there's no peace in your life. That's really hard to pull off. So this virtue category, it's like all of these things wrapped into one big bouquet of virtue. Yeah, Psalm chapter 1, if you want to... Um, Flip over there, you can, otherwise I'll just read it real fast. And just admitting this, I memorized this in the King James, so I put it up there in the King James because I would put it in the NIV and I would look at it and it would probably still come King James out of my mouth because I memorized this when I was like still in the womb, I think. So Psalm 1-1, blessed or blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And here it is. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Now, if I can ask it like this, why does he bringeth forth fruit? It says it right there. Why? Where is he? He's right next to the water. He's right next to the source of life. Those roots are going down deep into the ground and it's reaching out to that river, that river of life. And that's exactly where our fruit comes from. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives doing something, changing us, emptying our hearts of us and more and more and more of Him evidence of a true believer. Uh, here's some other passages. You don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 11 and 12 talk about it. Matthew 13, that's the parable of the sower. We know a sower went out and he cast some seed and went all these other places, but it found some good soil. And what happened to the seed in the good soil? It produced fruit. It sprung up, it grew, and it produced much fruit. You've also got Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, and then Ephesians chapter 5, I like this passage. It says this, it says, For you were once darkness. Now just right there, that is saying a lot. Notice it doesn't say, you once lived in darkness. It doesn't say, oh, for, for you were, you know, kind of, there was some darkness around, or, you know, you didn't have a whole lot of light in your life. It says, no, no, you were once darkness itself. That's a really big statement. He goes on. But now, now that you are a believer, a follower of Jesus, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Now, Paul puts some parentheses in there to give a little bit more explanation. So he says, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. The, the, the fruit of that light, oh man, it's goodness, it's righteousness and it's truth, virtue. Those are the things that we are supposed to be finding as we are living in Christ. He goes on, verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather Expose them, which is a whole other message we don't have time for today. Philippians chapter 1, 
verses 11. It says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes where? Through Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. Colossians 1.10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And then there's this colon, so it's like it pauses for a second. How? How are we supposed to please him in every way? Well, it says, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Some big stuff right there. You want to please God? Bear fruit. And then the last one in this category, James 3.17, which is funny because this is where we just were in the Taming Your Tongue series. Oddly enough, you know what the kids' lesson is today in the back? Taming the tongue. Coincidence. Pretty cool. James 3.17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and what? good fruit you want to be wise in the sight of the lord be full of and bearing good fruit impartial and sincere so there's five different categories of fruit that we said number one is virtue the second category of fruit is worship worship is fruit in hebrews chapter 13 starting in verse 15 it says through jesus therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And then the writer does that dash thing almost to explain what he is saying here. Continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Our worship to God is fruit. Now, we often think of worship as singing like we just did. That's one way of worshiping God, but that's not the only way of worshiping God. But this passage, I, I, I had to keep going in this. Watch how he ties in the next verse. He's saying, hey, guys, it's so important to produce fruit. One way that we produce fruit is that we worship God. We open up our mouths and with our lips, we praise his name. So important. But then watch verse 16. It says, and do not forget to do good, which doing good is virtue or fruit, right? As we're talking about, do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's really interesting that he says, yes, worship God, really important, that's fruit. But, oh, by the way, but don't forget to love other people, to bear fruit with other people. And we see this throughout Scripture. Remember, it says um, in Matthew, it's like, hey, remember, if you're going to offer a sacrifice to God uh, and you, you get your sacrifice up to the altar and you remember that you have a problem with your brother, leave your sacrifice at the altar, go first reconcile with your brother and then come back and offer your sacrifice. That's a really big statement right here of, of the writer of Hebrews saying, yes, we got to worship God, that's so important, but don't forget about loving other people. That is a huge part of bearing fruit. So we've got virtue. We've got worship. Number three, we've got giving. Giving. Now, giving is also a kind of worship, but giving is also a category of fruit. Philippians 4, 16 and 17. It says, For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Now, I'll explain what's happening here. Paul uh, he was on his missionary journey, uh, and he was kind of running out of resources. And this, this church, this church that didn't have a whole lot to begin with, gathered up this big offering and sent it to him. That, he, I mean, he needed it. He, he needed it to be able to go on to continue to spread the gospel, and that's how the gospel got spread all around in these nations. And Paul's like, hey, thank you so much for doing that. But he, he goes on, he said, not that I seek the gift, the gift that you sent me, that, that monetary gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What in the world is Paul saying here? He's like, listen, guys, that was, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for sending me that gift. Like, I really needed that. But you know what's cooler than that? You guys took up an offering, not out of your abundance, 
but basically you didn't have a whole lot and you took up an offering and you sent it to me and God sees that and oh my goodness, is he so pleased in that type of fruit? Like, yeah, it's cool. I got to reap the benefits of it, but what's even cooler than that is like I got to be a part in you guys bearing fruit. So giving is a type of a fruit. So we've got virtue, worship, giving. Number four, repentance. Repentance is a type of fruit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Here's John the Baptist. He's out, he's out at the Jordan and he's baptizing people. And it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And then he said that one little line, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were freaking out because there was this big religious activity that was happening that was not sanctioned by them. So they were like, no, 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 this can't be real because we're like the guys, okay? If anything religious or God happens, it comes from us. And so this can't be real. We're going to check it out and see what's happening. And, and uh, John the Baptist sees them and he's just like, you brood of vipers. And he just comes down on him. And he's like, you think you're doing so good? You know, you're living by the law and you're high and mighty and you're righteous and all of that. And, and he, he kind of says all this in that one little rhyme. He's like, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You need to repent of your nasty hearts, you Pharisees and Sadducees. No matter what good things you think you're doing, no. Repent. Repentance is a type of a fruit. So we have virtue, we have worship, we have giving, we have repentance. And the last one before we put it up on the screen, if I had to really press you, and say, okay, so we've got the virtue category, although you wouldn't have called it virtue, you would have called it the fruits of the Spirit. If I really said, okay, I really want you to dig deep and think about another way or another type of fruit that we can produce, you would probably say this one. And it's number five, it's leading people to Jesus. Right? That is a kind of fruit, absolutely. It's a very, very important kind of fruit. Romans chapter 1, verse 13 Paul is speaking here. He says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Paul saying, man, I really wanted to come to you guys because like, I wanted to share the love of Jesus with you guys, and I wanted you to come to true repentance and salvation because he offers so much more than this world. Like, like, like I, I, I just wanted you to know Jesus. So leading people to Jesus absolutely is a huge, huge way that we can produce fruit or a, a category of fruit. So here's a question. There's our, four, our five categories that we're going to look at. Here's a big question. Why is it so important that I give so much detail about fruit, right? Because let's face it, I could say, and, and what I've, I'll, I'll wrap it up here in one sentence of everything that I've said so far. Fruit, good. Sin, bad. Let's go to lunch, right? I mean, that's practically what I've said so far. Fruit is good, we should do that. Sin is bad, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't live for ourselves, we should live for God. It's pretty simple. So, so why is it such a big deal that we learn about all these different types of fruit? And yeah, I mean, I'm a good person and all that, and I'm not really doing all of those things, but, you know, they're important. They're important for, you know, like the pastors and the deacons and the elders and, the, you know, the people in the church and all of that. But, you know, that just really doesn't fit into my life. Why is it so important to see this? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we're going to park and spend the rest of our time. In Matthew chapter 7, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
And Matthew 7 is some of the clearest, most scary language or verbiage in all of Scripture. I mean, Matthew 7 is like where the rubber meets the road. Um, yeah, you better get this and understand this. Jesus leaves nothing left hanging. He is just laying it down. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, obviously, Jesus is talking about people who are professing to be Christians, right? I mean, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and if you just get that imagery, this, this wolf that has slaughtered a sheep and is just kind of wearing its clothing, which is kind of really weird, but like they're, they're disguised. It's not really a sheep, although it kind of looks like a sheep, mm, but there really is a wolf underneath there. And Jesus is saying, hey, watch out. Watch out for these false prophets. Watch out for these people who call themselves Christians, who call themselves followers of Jesus, who say that they, they have another teaching or another word or another religion or, yeah, the Bible, that's a great book, but there's also watch out for all of that. You want another watch out? Watch out for us, ourselves, when we think it's okay just to live lukewarm Christian lives, which, just a disclaimer, I don't really think there is such a thing. I don't really know if I believe so much in lukewarm Christians. Do we have different times in our lives where, you know, things, yes, absolutely. But this is a big testament to us to say, be careful, watch out. He goes on, verse 16. By your fruit, you will recognize him. And Jesus is talking about these people. They look like Christians. They kind of speak Christianese, right? You know those people? Man, they know all of the things to say. You know, they go to church pretty often. Sometimes they look like they're worshiping even more than others. And they look like they fit the part. But you have to watch their lives. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And then he gives us this example. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Now, pause for a second. Where have we recently heard that principle in another passage? Anybody remember? Remember in James? James, the half-brother of Jesus, is saying, you can't get salt water from a fresh water spring, and you can't get fresh water from a salt water spring. It doesn't really work like that. And Jesus is saying that exact same thing. I just wonder if James was thinking about Jesus saying this. And he probably heard Jesus say this maybe multiple times. And he's like, oh, okay, cool, I'll come up with my own analogy, but it's the same principle. You don't get good fruit from a bad tree. You don't get bad fruit from a good tree. And then there's verse 19 one of the scariest verses in Scripture. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, there is a lot of discussion on this verse. We're not going to get all into it today. There's people a lot smarter than me that believe this doesn't mean hell. This just means a punishment or something, and that very well may be People a lot smarter than me says, no, 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 this is talking about a real true follower of Jesus uh, or, or not. And if they're not bearing fruit, they're not a follower of Jesus and they will be cut down and thrown into the fire, which is hell. I don't really know. Here's what I do know. I don't want either one of those. I want to be cautious enough to where that's, I'm not even close to that. 
Like, I, I want to live my life that pleases Jesus in a way that there is just fruit. That's just what's happening. Not because I'm scared of being cut down and thrown into the fire, because that's what pleases my Savior. Because that's what makes a difference that's going to matter in 10,000 years. And that's what every single one of us should look at in our lives and, and inspect and say, am I bearing fruit? I call myself a follower of Jesus, but I, I mean, you've listed a lot of things and yeah, I, 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 I have love and, you know, I have some peace at times and um, I'm not really witnessing to other people, and I, I think I repented. I'm sorry for the things that I did. And, like, I, I give sometimes, and, and you know, I, I worship. I mean, we sing here, so that's... And so I want us all to kind of look at our lives and say, are we really bearing fruit like the Bible is so clear on? Verse 20, this is how he finishes. Thus... By their fruit, you will recognize them. Who's the them? False prophets, unbelievers, fakers. When I was a kid, I, I used to be a skater, and I was a halfway decent skater. Okay, I had half pipes and, and that. Uh, same principle goes for surfers. And, and, and you would see this kid, this new kid, he would show up with a brand new skateboard. It, it would look like it never hit the ground before. And I mean, and he was decked head to toe in all the skater gear, right? And you never saw him step on that board, right? Because he couldn't skate. What do we call those people? Posers. Yes, I'm so glad that some of you knew what it was, right? Pose, you're a poser, you're posing as this. You, you, and that's fine, and if you want to learn, that's great, but might want to tone it down a little bit. Like I said, same goes in surfing. Um, okay, so if you're um, just a white guy from the continental United States, and you go to Hawaii, and you go to some of their beaches, and you go to surf there in their territory, in the, in the Hawaiians' territory, Tony, what are you called? Well, okay, I, we're, we're in church, but the church word that you can use. Dead. De okay, dead. Okay, that, a howly. You're called a howly. Mm, you're not really a surfer, because you're not one of us, okay? Don't be a poser. Don't be a howly Christian. Be a true follower of Jesus in a way that, again, yes, there's going to be times in our lives where we're struggling with things and we're, we struggle with sin, just like, just like Paul. I, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I, what I don't want to do, I do it. And, and, but there should be this constant struggle in our lives that we are working towards that sanctification, that growth. And I just want us to be people that want to bear fruit. I want to be a part of a church that every single one of us just desires to bear fruit. Just tell me what to do. How can I serve? How can I love people better? What can I do? That's what I want us to be, church. Because, again, the whole thing is not to land on exactly what the theological meaning of Matthew chapter 7 is. And if you're going to hell, or I, that's not the point. But the point is, I think scripture is so clear as we read through it that if you're not able to look at your life, and again, this isn't a thing to where we're supposed to really look at other people's lives, but if you can't look at your own life and see fruit, there's a problem there. It's a really, really big problem there. So let's close with our key statement one last time. True followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit and sanctification. Let's pray. Jesus, once again, we thank you that you're so clear. That you don't leave it up for question, God, but that you say you want to live for me, bear fruit. So God, help us to get the nervousness out. God, whatever is keeping us from taking that next step in obedience, 
God, help us to do that. God, help us to be people that see others' needs, that see others' hurts, and that want to step into their lives and make a difference. God, help us to be generous people with our time, with our resources, with our love, with our grace, with our mercy. God, help us to be so generous. God, help us to be a church that moves this community forward. God, help us to be a church that if we disappeared tomorrow, God, I want this community to miss us. God, I want this community to have such a need for this church and not because we're great people, but because you are a great God and they see you in us. God, speak to our hearts as we work through this series of bearing fruit. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. And God, if there are those here this morning who do not know you as their personal Savior, right now in this moment, would you speak to their hearts? Help them to know their need for you. Help them to seek you. God, give them the courage to come and talk to one of us so that we can walk them through what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. God, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us. And not just to die, but to be raised again three days later. Taking our sin and taking our shame. Thank you, Jesus. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to worship you in that way. Help us to bear fruit in that way, God, that we can be such a generous people, that we can reach out to this community, reach out into this world, equip our missionaries, and God, do so much good in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And it is in the awesome, amazing name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.